a consumer's report is about life and what it's all about. Through the use of social satire in the poem, Porter subtly exposes how materialism often leaves us dissatisfied with our lives. The poet, Peter Porter, was Australian-born, but lived in Britain from 1951 until his death in 2010. He published 17 collections of his work, but had various other jobs before making a success of poetry. This included a short-lived career in journalism, working in a bookshop, but most relevantly to this poem, he worked as an advertising copywriter in the 1970s. It was during this time period that people began to acquire the money and inclination to purchase more and more products for the home and themselves. Advertising on TV and radio became much more entertaining and more influential. Porter was known for his satirical take on society, and Clive James, the famous writer, TV presenter and wit, and fellow British Australian, said of Porter's poetry that it is so freighted with learned references that I can't tell if I don't know what they mean. His poetry is funny, a little bit tricky, but not at all pretentious, and although A Consumer's Report was written in 1970, it is still very relevant today. Throughout this poem, Porter uses an extended metaphor, presenting life as a product that's used up and evaluated. So we can see that the conceit of the poem suggests that life has become commodified. By using the term consumer report, the poet brings to mind a witch report, if you're old enough to understand this reference, or a product review that you'd fill in for a market research company, or perhaps an Amazon review nowadays. What would you give your life so far? Five stars? Three? Well, that would depend upon your experiences, but also on your attitude. Do you have a pessimistic or an optimistic outlook? Through this clever parody of a product review, Porter raises ideas such as our dissatisfaction with life, as he noticed that we were becoming quite greedy and that our consumption wasn't necessarily making us happy. In this poem, which is quite conversational in tone, it's written in free verse, he plays around with the accepted attitude of the time, which was that the customer was always right. The poetic voice, or the consumer, sounds both assertive and slightly disgruntled at times. Nowadays, we are still avid consumers of products, although we buy in different ways, and we tend to put more and more on our bucket lists. Some of us have an addiction to posting glamorous, exciting images on social media accounts. So this poem contains some interesting themes such as avarice, self-obsession and the complexity of human nature. The title itself uses vocabulary that's associated with advertising or marketing and the key words I'm going to define here are consumerism, the propensity to consume and keep consuming, i.e. buying more and more stuff, consumer report, a review of a product's quality and value for money, and materialism, the belief that money and possessions are the most important thing in life. I'll read the poem, but you can skip over this bit if you've read it recently. The name of the product I tested is Life. I have completed the form you sent me and understand my answers are confidential. I had it as a gift. I didn't feel much while using it. In fact, I think I'd like to have been more excited. It seemed gentle on the hands, but left an embarrassing deposit behind. It was not economical, and I have used much more than I thought. I suppose I have about half left, but it's difficult to tell, although the instructions are fairly large. There are so many of them, I don't know which to follow, especially as they seem to contradict each other. I'm not sure such a thing should be put in the way of children. It's difficult to think of a purpose. Also, the price is much too high. Things are piling up so fast. After all, the world got by for a thousand million years without this. Do we need it now? Incidentally, please ask your man to stop calling me the respondent. I don't like the sound of it. There seem to be a lot of different labels. Sizes and colours should be uniform. The shape is awkward. It's waterproof, but not heat resistant. It doesn't keep, yet it's very difficult to get rid of. Whenever they make it cheaper, they seem to put less in. If you say you don't want it, then it's delivered anyway. I'd agree it's a popular product. It's got into the language. People even say they're on the side of it. Personally, I think it's overdone. 
a small thing people are ready to behave badly about. I think we should take it for granted. If its experts are called philosophers or market researchers or historians, we shouldn't care. We are the consumers and the last lawmakers. So finally, I'd buy it. But the question of a best buy I'd like to leave until I get the competitive product you said you'd send. The poem consists of only two stanzas, one very short, one very long. The first three-line stanza sounds somewhat legalistic. It reminds me of data protection small print nowadays. In it, the poetic voice agrees to complete the form on the understanding that his answers are kept confidential. Confidential means that the response must be private or secret, but there's an immediate irony here as we're all reading the report as we look at the poem. And of course, a report commissioned by a market research company isn't really private at all as everything you write will be analysed and discussed. The poem is immediately established as a monologue. We hear only one voice, the first person narrated throughout. The I in the poem is the consumer who's experiencing life and the you who is being referenced in the direct address is quite interesting. This is whoever gave him the product to try. Is this God? Normally you'd be given a product to review by a market research company, but this product is definitely life itself with a capital L and can only be God given in this context. Do we have conversations with our maker or question the meaning of life? Well, we might if we're having an existential crisis, and this is very much the crux of the poem. What is life all about? Why are we here? In the second stanza, the poetic voice calls life a gift. However, no one asked to be born, as my children regularly remind me. And whilst the noun gift has really positive connotations of delight and God's grace, these connotations soon dissipate during the next few lines, as the consumer didn't feel much and would have liked to have been more excited. The suggestion here in these gloomy, unimpressed responses to something as wonderful as life itself is that we fail to appreciate our time on earth because if we actually think about our genetic inheritance, our conception, safe birth and successful development during childhood, it's all pretty miraculous. The end stop line serves to further emphasise the consumer's lack of excitement. In the next couple of lines, Porter references some famous adverts in his diction choices. Gentle on the hands makes us think of a particular brand of washing up liquid, and Embarrassing Deposit also references a cleaning product advert. If life can leave an embarrassing deposit, this could imply that life is messy and complicated, not always gentle at all. Indeed, the body and its functions, blood and gore, are often literally messy and a cause of shame. It may be worth noting here by way of context that Porter made at least one attempt on his own life as a young man, and he also lost his first wife to suicide, so he had personal experience of life being extremely complicated. Life is also not economical, the speaker complains. In this current cost of living crisis, we can perhaps empathise with this idea of existing being costly, but not only monetarily, emotionally too, there is suffering in life. In this section from It Was Not Economical down to contradict each other, we have a lot of enjambment. The speaker's on a roll and this creates a sense of pace and in fact he complains in parenthesis that his life has passed quickly, he's used up more than he thought. Life is quite fleeting or transient and we don't know when exactly it's going to end for us, it's difficult to tell. Here, there's a sense of awareness of our mortality, which does tend to dawn on people when they reach a certain age. Porter was middle-aged when he wrote this poem in 1970. Humorously, the speaker whinges that the instructions for life are fairly large. There's so much to read and learn in life, so much small print. Everyone tries to guide us as well. Think of all the people that you have given you direction parents, grandparents, teachers, peers, etc. Sometimes it's difficult to know what advice to take. It can all be a bit overwhelming. And how do we live our best life? There's not a simple answer to this. The purpose of life in line 19 refers to the meaning of life. There's a huge philosophical question here. Why are we here? What's it all about?
life is presented as a dangerous product. Returning to the semantic field of cleaning products, Porter says that it shouldn't be put in the way of children making it sound like bleach, which would carry that kind of warning on the bottle, keep out of the reach of children. Whilst humorous in a way, as of course we can't bubble wrap our children, they have to live their own lives and fight their own battles, perhaps it also raises a more serious issue. Is it morally right to bring children into such a flawed world? Should we create new life in an overpopulated, unstable and dangerous planet? Perhaps look up what was in the news on the day that you were born. Was there a war breaking out somewhere, a natural disaster, a riot? You get the picture and it's a little bit depressing. Another complaint that the speaker has is that the price of life is too high, which links with the earlier comments about life being costly to maintain and there being an emotional cost to living. You may have heard of the idiomatic phrase, grief is the price you pay for love, and similarly, death is the price you pay for life. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, as it says in the Bible in the book of Job. The intensifier so in things are piling up so fast and the enjambment in lines 21 to 24 perhaps suggests that life is out of control. After all, there wasn't life on Earth initially in Precambrian time which stretched from when our planet first existed about 4.6 billion years ago until the Paleozoic era which started 542 million years ago. Single cell organisms only started to develop right at the end of that time period. And humans are pretty recent examples of life on Earth. Homo sapiens have been around for only 200,000 years. If the Earth survived for billions of years without us, are we a necessary product? Actually, we aren't that notable in the grand scheme of things. In line 25, we have a comment in parenthesis where the poetic voice addresses directly whoever's organised this market research, or God, depending on how you interpret the poem. Please ask your man to stop calling me the respondent. This serves two purposes. It reminds us of the humorous conceit of the poem, someone doing a product review on life itself. And it brings the focus back to the idea of consumerism because the poem has become quite philosophical and this philosophical train of thought is interrupted for a while. The speaker or writer he's filling in a form after all sounds like a difficult customer. I don't like the sound of it. And having complained about the label of respondent, the speaker notes that there seem to be lots of different labels in life. This metaphor makes a good point. In a way, people are labelled or commodified and then judged according to society's standards and expectations, tolerances or fashions. Through this extended metaphor of people as products, Porter makes the point that people come in all sorts of packaging. If we consider for a moment gender, race, religion, language, politics, culture and all the different ideas and perspectives that people have, we are certainly not uniform even though we're all human. There's a lot of conflict in the world and in a way humans are very tribal beings and therefore our interactions with each other can be quite complicated and polarised. Even our human bodies, the shape of us, our containers or packaging is quite awkward and embarrassing. See also line five of the poem. Now the human body is described here as being waterproof. We can indeed swim and shower, etc. But our exposure to heat is less comfortable. We're not heat resistant. This makes the body sound as if it's a product that's been tested in a lab to see what it can cope with. Our bodies don't keep. Like unrefrigerated food products, we perish or degrade over time. We age. And ultimately, we're impermanent. We die. Paradoxically, although we deteriorate over time, life is very difficult to get rid of when it's not your time to go. This could reference how difficult it is to kill yourself or other people, mercifully. Of course, murder is illegal and so was suicide until quite recently. Have you heard the phrase, life is cheap? Sometimes we use this when referring to developing countries where birth rates are high, but so is infant mortality and the death rate in general. The respondent or speaker complains that when life is cheaper, there is less in the package. Think about whether you're likely to have a better or more fulfilling life if you can spend more, but perhaps don't think about obvious material products. 
such as cars, but also consider the cost of healthcare, education, travel, and how these things can actually affect what sort of life we lead. After the dash, which creates a caesura or pause, we are reminded of the idea of life being a gift that we don't ask for and may not even want, but it's delivered anyway. The word delivered makes me think of parcels and babies. There's a delivery suite in a maternity ward. Of course, we cannot control where in the world we're born or to whom. And some people are born into very easy existences and others into much more challenging circumstances. In the next line, the poem starts to sound more upbeat. Notice the place of alliteration in popular product. There's certainly a lot of human life around. In fact, there were about 8 billion human lives by the end of 2022, and the vast majority of us are keen to try and stay alive for as long as we can. People even say they're on the side of it, could refer to human rights, or the abortion debate, or even the debate about assisted dying. Describing life as overdone or overrated is quite interesting and could be ironic. The poetic voice tells us that people are willing to behave badly about it. Again, notice the plosive sounds which creates a tone of disapproval. Well, I'd kick up a fuss about my human rights, and this phrasing perhaps brings to mind various protests, including historically the suffragette movement, more recently protests about the climate emergency. The caesura here creates a little pause to allow us to reflect upon this. Depending upon where you are in the world, you may be thinking about all sorts of protests to protect human rights. There's a lot of irony in this poem because however much we whinge about life, and in many ways this poem is a litany of complaints, we tend to want to cling to it at all costs. But let's not get too serious because the advice from the speaker is to just take life for granted get on with it and maybe we should be less analytical, less philosophical, stop comparing ourselves to others and just exist in a more contented manner. This is perhaps contrary to what the reader might expect here. We're used to being told in poetry not to take life for granted. Carpe diem, seize the day. In fact, the speaker tells us it doesn't matter what the experts think about how to live your life and it doesn't matter what philosophy or which philosophy we live by or whether or not we go down in history. We should just live and let live because we are the consumers and the last lawmakers. The collective pronoun we appeals to the reader and makes us sound like a rallying cry, as if we're all in this together and have some sort of control over how our lives play out. In the short, sharp, end-stopped phrase, so finally I'd buy it, the poetic voice sounds conclusive, life's worth having, but there's an afterthought. Is life a best buy or is there an even better product on the market? This could refer to heaven and the afterlife. And it wasn't so long ago that the idea of life after death as compensation for enduring life on earth was pretty popular. The phrase, you said you'd send, with its repetition and sibilance, signifies uncertainty about whether he will actually receive this product, because of course we don't really know if there is anything for us after death, or if this is all there is. So in this playful, satirical poem, with its slightly ridiculous conceit, some important ideas are raised. Life is presented as something precious, yet commonplace, complicated but also something we're often dissatisfied with. And our greed and materialism are presented as key components of our existential angst. Of course, existentialism is a philosophy made famous by Jean-Paul Sartre, who thought that our lives were really about personal responsibility in a seemingly meaningless universe. Perhaps by using the format of a consumer review and the extended metaphor of life as a product, as well as the ambiguity about who the narrator is addressing, God or a market researcher, we start to think about what we value or worship in a capitalist society. One of the most important things that Porter reveals in this work is that true contentment cannot be found through material possessions. We shouldn't judge ourselves or anyone else by what we or they have. The most important thing in life is our outlook and our character. 
Despite having worked in advertising, Porter was not a materialistic person. As he got older, he complained in an interview that central London was filling up with people showing off the super rich with their horrible cars. He didn't even drive. I hope you found this video useful and do please take a moment to give it a thumbs up.